This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf. And it is a party today, a party of one, me, myself, and I. But lucky for all of you, I come with many, many pets. In fact, in my living room right now in a beautiful whelping pen with a heating pad is a mama dog and her seven puppies that were born on Saturday. So we're going to post a picture so you can see just how cute a one-day-old puppy looks. Oh my gosh, so cute. And that soft blanket you see behind the puppy is not a blanket. That's mama's tummy. Can you imagine how soft that would be? It's like softer than soft when I feel it with my hand. But imagine being a newborn that can't see and can't hear. And all you can do is smell and feel. And you get to snuggle up with that, with that lovely poodle, white, silky, warm fur. Yes, yes. What a nice way to begin life. So that's what we got going here at Camp Good Dog. And if you want to see puppy pictures, so we got those. They're a couple days old now, and we'll be posting pictures. And we also have some puppies that were born last March that you can look at. One in particular, Fabio, because he's fabulous. And he's white, and he just got a haircut, and he's all spiffy. And then uh, we have some doodles, a year-old doodle that's available because her owners had to relocate. Uh, And her name's Sweetie, and they had to move to the Middle East. And sometimes you get a dog with the best of intentions. They had a house and a yard here in Canada, and they got this big golden doodle from me a year ago, and they love her, and she loves them, and she's great with their kids and getting in the car and all the other things you want. A very boisterous, athletic, happy-go-lucky, sweet-natured, loving golden doodle. But they're moving to the Middle East to an apartment, which is another family for a while. And then they'll be in transition and probably end up somewhere else. They're starting in Iran. And it's a place where dogs aren't really tolerated indoors unless they're tiny in this neighborhood that they're moving to. And there's just no way for her to go. So they don't anticipate being back here for years. So the most humane thing was to find a new home for her, which I totally agree with. So that's what I'm trying to do. Her name's Sweetie. And I gave her a haircut so she's freshly shaved with a little crew cut. Unfortunately, winter came, but she needed a haircut, so she's got one. And if you have a dog that your timing gets off and you end up giving it a haircut in the wrong season, just put the jacket on. I know it seems cutesy and maybe it's only good for Pomeranians and Pekingese, but no. If you have a big dog that gets a surgery and gets shaved half its body, get a jacket. It's the humane thing to do, right? Or if you have a dog that gets groomed and you're just kind of, you call the groomer and they're busy and they're busy and they're busy. And then finally you get in and it's snowstorm day. Give your dog a jacket when you go for a walk. (laughs) She's naked and it's cold out there. Think about it. Okay. So I want to talk about lots of things. So we got them available. We also have golden retrievers available. There were a lot of them and now there's less half of sold found new homes, golden retriever purebreds. There's five males, no girls left, but that's okay because we have three golden doodle girls that are also looking for homes. All of them were born in August. So if you want to see cute puppies, this is what I'm saying. If you want to see these guys dressed up for Halloween, scroll back a week or two. If you, Because <laughs> we dressed them up. Of course we did. If you want to see Sweetie or you want to see a golden retriever puppy that's few months old or a standard poodle puppy or a golden doodle puppy and you want to compare and you just like puppies, go to our Facebook Camp Good Dog page because you will see puppies, puppies, puppies. That's what you'll see. All right, we're going to go to a break. And when we come back, I'm going to answer a listener's question, which was, why doesn't my dog learn by watching? Okay, well, first of all, your dog does learn by watching. Stay tuned to Animal Party on Cat Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. 
With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, you're back on Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Jeff Wolf. Why doesn't my dog learn by watching, he asks. Okay, well, your dog does learn by watching. I'll give you a few examples. The escape artist dog that notices when you don't lock the latch properly or your tenant leaves it open. They're watching. It looks locked. It looks closed. To the non-observant human that tried to close it, it seemed closed. But your dog learned that if he doesn't hear the click, he can open it. And now he's watching and listening and waiting for his opportunity. So it's a combination of smelling and listening and seeing because they're not, most dogs are not as visual as they are auditory or smell influenced. But, you know, things give off sense, things give off sounds, and they do pay attention. Some dogs are visual. And I'll give you some examples of those. So, well, first of all, any dog, no matter what breed, if he's really, really bright, he may understand visual commands. If you train him early to pick up on them with you, he'll be in tune to more visual things. Any dog can receive visual impact and learn from it. But some dogs are keyed up that way. They just can't help it. And these are the dogs you find staring at you, (laughs) like border collies. Number one example Like You sort of feel watched whenever you own one. Yes, because they're waiting for the next command. And if they were out in the field or the meadow or the pasture or the acreage, they would be looking for commands from a really far distance. So things, subtle things like the way you move your horse on the other side of the herd or the way you signal with your arm, you know, and your silhouette against the sky like that. That's a lot of visual impact. So do they learn by watching? Yes. And if you're talking about learning new things, I have noticed a group effort here to outsmart me with gates. So I think this is both learning by watching and communicating because one dog will demonstrate, Dorita the Golden Doodle, who's now three, for example, will throw her body weight against the gate and demonstrate to the others that it moves slightly. Another one will watch this a little while, maybe a poodle, big poodle, and start throwing his body weight. Now we've got a twosome. A third one will come along and see that the gate is moving. (laughs) And now we've got an open gate and they're chasing goats and I have to go running out there with my staff to try to catch them all. Fix the gate, change the gate, repair it, make it so it won't work that way for a while. So do dogs learn by watching? I think they do. I think they do. Here's another example. When I go down to the kennel, sometimes there's a dog who's checked in who's really nervous. And maybe he's warmed up to the person who was working when he checked in, but maybe he's never met me or she's never met me. She's never met the staff or it's just a new environment and the dog's panicking. And sometimes the dog really doesn't want to be touched and it'll be hiding in the corner of its pen. There's water, there's food, there's a bed, but it's not having any of it. It's just hiding, shaking, sometimes snarling or growling at me, really upset thinks I'm going to hurt it. And all I want to do is take it out, let it have a pee break, give it some cuddles, you know, you know, treat it nicely and bring it back in again. So what do I do in this situation? Oftentimes I will take another dog who absolutely loves me. One who's really demonstrative, like sweetie, the one, the golden doodle I told you about, or any golden retriever, any lab that's visiting some dog who just knows how to cuddle. And I'll take that dog right outside the pen of the dog who's scared and just love it up. Just sit on the floor, dog lies on my lap, and I cuddle it, and I cuddle it, tell how good a dog it is, and a baby talk and everything. And before long, the other dog's like, oh, she's cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what she wants to do. All right. I'll go with her. I'd say eight out of 10 times it works. So you can't tell me they don't learn by watching. If I were to take another dog and hold it outside that pen and do something 
maybe clean its ears, you know, so <laughs> that would send the opposite message. Even though my intent is good, that would be the wrong way to go about this because then the panicking dog would panic too. And the dog getting its ears done would send off all these, oh, I hate this vibe and it wouldn't work out well at all. So even though it would be showing that I'm a carer, it's not the way to go. You want to just, you know, give that dog treats and love and spoil it and make it look like the best thing ever. So the dogs, if the dog's a ball dog, Bring a dog out and play ball with it till the dog in the cage is dying to play ball with you. I mean, that's all you got to do. That means they're watching and paying attention. So I wanted to compare this to some other animals I've worked with. Cats. Oh, cats so learned by watching. They'll see a cat do something once and then they'll copy. And I'm thinking um, immediately, dogs do this too, though, but immediately I'm thinking of the cat doors. When I install a new cat door, I change the door or I have to repair it or something's different about it. One cat will be brave enough to test it. Only one. It's usually a bigger cat with more weight to it. So it can push it open with its head and the others will sit around watching <laughs> and then they'll all try it. So there's a good example. With the doggy doors over the years, I've noticed because whenever I take one of my puppies that is waiting to be adopted up to the house for their turn to have, you know, house time and all that, I notice how quickly they learn to go in and out my doggy door. And with poodles, it's the same day. With the standard poodle that comes up to the house, no matter what age it is, it sees the other dogs go in and out the doggy door. I never have to show it anything. It just does it. Same day. Okay. <laughs> With golden doodles, it's a couple of days usually. And in one case, Dorita, the one I have now, I never had to show her. So remember, even if your breed is maybe not so smart, your dog might be smart. And the more you teach them and the more you uh, develop those skills, give them something to think about, the smarter your dog will be. So Dorita learned the doggy door in one day, but I do remember Paprika. I had this red golden doodle. She's long ago gone to her home, but she was so sweet and she was bright red and she was just the coolest dog. And I had her up for her house time and it took so many repetitions. I had a poodle up at the same time that it already learned it was going in and out, in and out, in and out. <laughs> and Paprika would be stuck outside in the rain, staring at the dog door wondering how these poodles worked such magic that they could just walk through walls, you know? Now, if she were a pug, it probably would have taken a lot longer. If she were a Shiba Inu, I wouldn't have had to show her once. So that's an interesting fact. If you own a dog like a Shiba Inu or a Malamute, you'd probably find the dog quite difficult to train, not that interested in tricks, and eager to escape. But escape is their talent. So getting in and out of things, they'll learn by watching and they'll learn it well. So, so that um, kind of reminds me of this contrast. There used to be these two labs, Ollie and Trooper, and they lived in a really fancy part of Vancouver. And I would walk them and train them and take care of them sometimes. And when I would go to pick them up, the big black labs, they looked like little bears, very stocky sort of things. And they would leap in the air, all four feet in the air, just leap totally above the fence, though. Like any other dog that I owned would have jumped over. I mean, at least to greet me, maybe jump back again, some of my poodles. But these guys were convinced they couldn't go over the hand fence. And they would just leap up, leap up, leap up like pogo sticks until I opened the door. It's so odd. The gate was half the size they were, but no, they weren't passing it. And um, so that would never happen with a Shiba Inu or a Malamute or a Husky or any of these dogs that, you know, where you read in the breed book, stealthy escape is one of their skills. Okay, so we're going to go to break and come back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Stay tuned with me, Dabble. For those fortunate to have experienced the deep bond and unconditional love of a companion animal, the death that follows can be one of the most difficult and misunderstood losses to go through. Many times, this devastating loss goes unrecognized and trivialized by family and friends leaving grieving pet parents struggling to find healthy ways to cope with the loss. In And I Love You Still, a thoughtful guide and remembrance journal for healing the loss of a pet, Dr. Julianne Corbin calls attention to the difficulties unique to the loss of a beloved pet and provides an interactive and compassionate guide to help you process your loss and work towards coming to a place of peace and healing. For those interested in journal therapy, and looking for a professionally written and compassionate resource to help understand and reconcile the grief associated with the loss of your pet, this book is for you. And I Love You Still, 
A Thoughtful Guide and Remembrance Journal by Julianne Corbin is now available for purchase on Amazon and other major book retailers. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with Deb Wolf. And, okay, I, I was listening to the, I was watching TV and this comedian was on the television and he was so funny. And he was talking about cats and he did a whole routine about cats. And one of the things he said was cats get to keep a box of their own poop in your house. Your grandma, no way. You'd never let her do it. And I thought... Well, that's an interesting, you know, interesting contrast. We do spoil our cats. Thinking about um, kittens and puppies and how cute they are. You know, a lot of puppies are born with this sort of, um, well, first of all, their eyes are closed. At 10 days, they open their eyes. And then it's not really dark brown or black like you would think. It's a bluey purple, just like newborn human babies often have. But kittens, they're always born with blue eyes. And then they change. So when they open their eyes, it's always a flash of blue. But and then you don't know what's going to happen. Well, you can kind of guess from the parents, but, you know, you don't really know. Um, I'm just thinking. So light bulbs. OK, we were talking about breeds. So the other day, some of my dogs got into this shelving unit that I've had there for ages and they've never been interested in it before. I don't know what struck them. It has things in it like um well, their wormer medicine, their flea products. I mean, stuff that they're not really interested in. No food, a couple of screwdrivers, a hammer on the bottom shelf. It's a three shelf unit. But there were light bulbs in there that I'd forgotten were even in there. And for some reason, light bulb looks like ball, right? So one dog who likes to chew paper took out these light bulbs and chewed off all the paper. That was a poodle. And then another dog who likes to play with balls a golden retriever, picked up the light bulbs and was taking them around the house. So I come down in the morning and there's light bulbs everywhere and chewed up paper. And and she, you know, I said, what happened here? And the golden runs over and grabs me a light bulb and brings it to me and drops it in my hand. Okay, so that's what happened. And the poodle runs over and starts chewing the paper that she's hoarded in her dog bed. And I'm just like, you know, it's so by breed. I mean, the any other dog would have been cut by that. Now, I've moved the light bulbs, of course, of course. And I, I will, I've never, I mean, that, that shelving unit's been there with light bulbs for years. Don't know what struck them that particular day. But if it had been a terrier, if it had been a Doberman, if it had been a Wheaton, if it had been any other dog but a retriever with a soft mouth made to carry gently, I would have had that bills of blood all over the place. So I'm really grateful that it was the, the golden retriever that um, that picked up the light bulbs. So yeah, what a strange thing to wake up to, looking around going, what is going on here? And none of the dogs, they're all sleeping, lying around, greeting me. Nobody, Yeah. But and, and she didn't think she did anything wrong. Obviously, it looked like a ball to her and she didn't break it. So good job. Yes, good job. They have to have jaws strong enough and the right temperament to carry a struggling wounded duck without harming it. So we get to eat it. That's the deal there with the labs and the goldens and why they're so gentle with their mouths. And standard poodles are also retrievers. They're cold water retrievers. That's why that poofy haircut came about. It's designed to let them be streamlined in the water swimming and dry quickly, but still give them warmth and cushioning where, you know, on hips and certain parts of their body that need it. It's been exaggerated to a degree that makes them comical or beautiful, depending on your perspective. But originally they were German hunting dogs. And to that, I just want to do a shout out to Chris over there in Richmond. You sent me a letter. You promised me a picture of your poodle, your standard poodle, in later hosen for Halloween. And I never got that picture. <laughs> and I want that picture. So send me that picture. You know how. Okay. So I'm just going to go through a few other things before we wrap up the show. I also may get some footage of Nutmeg, who is a red standard poodle born here in March. And she went to her new family, as you know, many pups do. But they were really unsure. Someone in the house isn't that well. And 
Only the mom wants the dog and the kids want the dog, but the dad doesn't. There's some kind of issue there. So they said, can we try her for a week? Of course, you could try her for a week. So off they go. And the weekend went really, really well. But then the week came and they didn't follow instructions, which was to kennel her whenever you're not home and at night. And they left her in a room and she went, you know, she partied like a rock star, basically. So now they don't know what to do. So we've tried to say to them, well, try what we suggested for the rest of the week. And if not, just bring her back. So she may come back too. And if she comes back, oh my, she's a looker. She is like red, red, red and just beautiful dog. So if she comes back, I will surely post pictures of her too. And if you just scroll back on Camp Good Dog Facebook, you can see little nutmeg gorgeous little red poodle so we do have quite a few puppies for adoption right around now and then uh and then we'll be taking a break uh i wanted to just comment on the news before we go apparently toronto is bragging again now those of you in america may not know that there's a little bit of an attitude situation going on up here in canada vis-a-vis toronto versus everybody else and um, toronto likes to call itself the center of the universe. Yeah, really, really. And uh, also the New York of the North. Oh, please. But sometimes I'm born in Toronto and now I live in Vancouver. So this rivalry, which is gentle and friendly, is very much active in my mindset with my family back in Toronto and um, all my current life here for so many years. But Toronto, okay, I'm going to give you the award. You win. You win on this. Right. I'm always saying how Vancouver's better because it is in every single way, except Toronto. Congratulations. You have more rats than Vancouver. Well done, Toronto. Accolades on that. Even though you're not a port city, you don't enjoy the ocean. You don't enjoy the world's traffic coming in and out. You stay home and you have freezing winters. You still manage to have more Norway rats than our lovely city with all our beaches. So congratulations, Toronto. I just wanted to send that out to you. Okay, so this is a weird one. In Central Saanich, which is on Vancouver Island, just recently, a cat was rescued. Really weird. Pickles the cat. And orange tabby male, kind of -of run-of-the-mill looking to me when I saw the footage. But anyway, kind of chubby. They found him inside a car engine, and firefighters had to get this cat out. But when they got it out, and it was stuck, and it was complaining, but when they got it out, it was so friendly to be touched and grabbed and taken out, even though it had obviously gone feral. It turns out Pickles was missing for two years, and now it's been reunited with his family. So well done, Pickles. Okay, so one more news story before we go, and this is a weird one, but I do like weird things, especially animal things. So you know how sometimes people you know have these weird conspiracy theories, or they think They believe in unicorns or Sasquatch or something like that. Okay, so we have one of those out here in Lake Okanagan, which is in the middle of our province of British Columbia. It's an unusually deep lake, so deep that even the most modern instruments can't track how deep it is. And there's legends and myths about a creature who lives in the lake, gigantic lake, connects to other lakes underground and all this. Okay, the creature's supposed to be sort of like the Loch Ness Monster, sort of dinosaurish with a long head and serpent, but a huge body lives in the lake. And it's called the Ogopogo. You can look it up. I'm not making this up. The Ogopogo in Okanagan Lake. Okay. So there's been a sighting. Only this sighting, the people, the average you know, couple doing some camping or whatever, spot this thing and film it. And the film was on the news and I saw it. And sometimes you see something that tells you something and you hear them analyze it. You hear the experts report on it. And that makes no sense. This is one of those cases. What I saw, what they filmed is something I have never seen before. I have no idea what that thing was. It was a floating round ish in all ways, three foot by two foot clump with nodules and horns that was alive. Now, I don't know if that's an Ogopogo larva or an Ogopoga half-hatched egg. I don't know. It had two horns. You can look this up. But the experts say it's an aquatic bird. Okay, I even worked with aquatic birds. I've worked with birds. That's not a bird. Birds don't look like that. I I don't know why they say it's an aquatic bird. I think they just want to calm the public. Honestly, sometimes, I mean, at least a little bit of honesty would be good. I don't know what it is, 
but it's not an aquatic bird. So I want you to check that out. And you tell me, what do you think that thing is? All right. So if you have any questions, dogs, cats, strange occurrences in the animal world that are not aquatic birds, anything you want to tell me, you can reach me through Pet Life Radio. And if you want to see adorable puppies and kittens, or well, puppies, 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 no kittens this time. I didn't even pose my cats in costumes this year. I had mercy on them. I just went crazy on the puppies and the dogs. So if you want to see dogs in costume and dogs just running around the farm in all different stages of puppies, go to Camp Good Dog Facebook. And there's one more thing I want to say before I end. I was looking at my numbers, and I'm really shocked and pleased that this show now has over 7 million monthly listeners and we live stream to 250 million people that are subscribers, which I have to try not to think about when I go on the air because that is a ton of dogs and cats. If everybody owns one, there's a ton of dogs and cats I'm affecting, which is wonderful. So I hope from me to all you listening out there, well, actually, if you've got a company and you sell something, you make something that's good for dogs or cats, contact us. We'd love to do commercials for you. And it's a very targeted audience. If you sell online, it's a perfect audience for you. So, okay, but I just want to say to all those 7 million monthly listeners and 250 million subscribers, thank you for listening. And from me, Deb Wolf, Animal Party and Pet Life Radio, be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.